Good morning, everyone. This is Jesse Silvera with Spirit of the Coast Analytics. Today, we'll be showcasing our January 2023 roundup, which includes an overview and light comparison of Cassava Science's semifilum, shed light on some of the research we've been doing on Blarcamazine's restorative properties, and share some relevant research that caught our attention this month. Before we get started, I want to thank Jeffrey G. and David S. for their patronage. Your tips largely paid off the video editing software used for this video. As mentioned, the first item of business today will be going over Cassava's recently announced Phase 2 Alzheimer's top-line data with the Semophilum scaffolding compound. Right off the bat, Cassava claimed ADAS COG scores improved in 47% of patients, with these responders garnering a mean change of negative 4.7 points. Additionally, 23% of patients declined less than 5 points which the company claims is meaningful over a hypothetical placebo. What we really want to hone in on are three categories. Cassava gave the data points for their mild stage patient cohort, moderate stage patient cohort, and the full patient population separately, which allowed us to do some simple math and create some charting off of that. From our chart on the right side, you can visualize the baseline for each of these cohorts as well as the progression in cognition at the end of the 12-month trial. The black slopes represent change in mean score, with descending slopes uh, signifying improvement and ascending slopes decline or worsening. The mild stage patients improve by negative 2.4 points. While not clinically meaningful, this is an extremely positive result. Meanwhile, the moderate stage patient, patients worsened on average about what you'd expect from placebo control at 4.4 points. So unusually, semophilum doesn't appear to be even remotely effective for most moderate stage patients. I do expect there to be some responders in this group, however. And lastly, we have the whole patient population, which garnered a 0.5 point decline. Without context, this indicates an overall stagnation in disease course, although with context, as we know, Earlier stage patients actually yielded a net improvement result. We did notice pretty massive deviation in scores. For example, the whole population and cognition score had a deviation of 13.3, which is a bit troubling. Overall, we are pleased with Cassava's data. Another trial is warranted to garner definitive assessment, but preliminary findings are overall encouraging, despite scores failing to reach clinical meaningful status in the aforementioned cohorts. We also noticed that no p-values were provided for the ADAS COG data, so it's unclear to us at this time if these scores are statistically significant. We then wanted to take a look at Barcamazine's preliminary 2B3 top line data to see if we could compare the data sets. So patients treated with Barcamazine were 84% more likely to have improved cognition by ADAS COG score change of negative 0.5 points or better from baseline to end of treatment than patients on placebo. Patients whose cognition improved on ADAS-COG did so with a mean change of negative 4.03 points. And I wanted to note here that moderate dose patients likely bogged down that total score. 50 milligram only patients probably improved by negative five or negative six points, but we're still waiting for uh, that additional data. In all patients, blarcamazine reduced cognitive decline measured by ADAS-COG by 45%. Treatment in mean score change of negative 1.85 points. So we can see here that the data readouts aren't apples to apples. However, it does give good indication to a comparative result. The data indicates that blarcamazine is likely more efficacious than semophilum, as it's probable over 47% of Anavex's 50 milligram patients were responders with higher cognitive scores, probably exceeding negative 5 or negative 6 ADAS COG points. Additionally, Cassava's phase two was open label and therefore should be viewed appropriately. All Cassava patients were at the 100 milligram max dose, whereas only 50% of Anavex's patients were on the 50 milligram max dose in that trial, which again probably bogged down the negative 4.03 responder total score as mentioned earlier. Many of you probably recognize this slide from our previous video. The only changes was a call out of the negative three point zone, which is about 
uh, what is considered to be a clinically meaningful change over a one-year time frame in Alzheimer's patients. And of course, we added the three cohorts from the previous slide, which as indicated by the large which are indicated by the large dash black arrows. I think the slide speaks for itself, but we see that moderate stage patients declined much like placebo or an untreated group, the full population stabilized, and the mild or earlier patients did well, just not quite making the cutoff for clinically meaningful standard. We do want to note that their responders, the 47% of patients that responded at negative 4.7 points, do reach clinically meaningful standard. So how does semaphilum relate to blarcamazine, and what are the key takeaways from our analysis? Semaphilum resumes homeostasis to the FLNA protein. FLNA is a scaffolding protein which tethers like downstream proteins together and navigates them to the correct cascade or complex, because there's many different complexes and, con and cascades uh, within our neurons. Semaphilum is almost certainly downstream from blarcamazine. Being a chromatin remodeler and sigma-1 receptor agonist, blarcamazine ensures proteins are created or translated correctly, which includes scaffolding proteins like FLNA. There's evidence of blarcamazine success in translating scaffolding proteins, as genomic data revealed upregulation of the ras erc pathway, which is a function of other scaffolding proteins. The cassava trial results are plagued by massive deviation, indicating inconsistency. Again, was the data statistically significant? It's unclear, at least in their cognitive data. Following interim data throughout the trial, it appears as though more responders were evident in the earlier enrolled patients, which led to a drop-off in overall ADAS cog improvement. Data suggests semaphilum is likely vastly more effective in earlier Alzheimer's or MCI patients, as the moderate stage patients may as well have been on a placebo. Total patient population score indicates stagnation in disease progression, but if accounting for responders only, which is again mostly in early patients, but there probably is at least a few in the moderate uh, stage patients as well, um, then we see an overall improvement in patient cognition. Our bottom line assessment is that blarcamazine is likely upstream from semaphilum. This is evidenced not only by the compound's mechanism of action, but also by a clinical result. While the blarcamazine 50 mg responder ADAS COG mean score is not currently available, it almost certainly exceeds negative 5 or negative 6 ADAS COG, which beats semaphilum's best case responders at negative 4.7 points. Considering semaphilum's complete inability to treat moderate stage Alzheimer's patients, it is curious to consider whether blarcamazine could garner early and moderate stage Alzheimer's patients on their label due to previous trials signaling slowing in that population. So there was a limited efficacy in earlier trials. Overall, if duplicated in placebo-controlled study with statistical significance, semaphilum still represents a significant advance over existing Alzheimer's therapies and may fill small gaps in blarcamazine coverage in, in, a, in a subgroup of patients, especially those that... Uh, for whatever reason, require uh, additional scaffolding proteins to be enhanced. In our next section, we'll discuss a few items of research explored this month regarding restorative properties of blarcamazine, the criticality of serotonin and mild cognitive impairment, and recent research of sigma-1 receptor properties against diabetes. Now, we believe we've done a pretty good job elucidating how blarcamazine halts disease progression, but we wanted to learn more about its restorative properties. Now, as we know, blarcamazine enhances cellular homeostasis by chromatin remodeling, mitochondrial restoration, protein clearing, and autophagy and apoptosis control. Sigma-1 receptor activation dramatically enhances cellular response to stress, fixes protein translation, mitochondrial health, protein clearing, and endoplasmic reticulum stress. It saves cascading cellular failure, and it prompts decreases in neuroinflammation, which we believe is a factor that makes disease reversal extremely difficult. Now that neuroinflammation has dampened, our brain circuitry can begin rebalancing and growing through neurogenesis and plasticity. Blarcamazine enhances BDNF, synaptic function, and acts on guidance. The specifics on how blarcamazine guides axons was a new topic for us. 
Here's an image of a neuron and the axon. The axon is a nerve fiber. It's longer and slender with the primary function of transmitting information to other neurons, muscles, and glands. Unlike dendrites, they are far reaching within the brain and connect to synapses throughout. They do this by weaving themselves through complicated masses of synapses and circuitry. Being that neurons only have one axon, you can see how important it is for the axon to reach its correct destination. While axon guidance is still under quite a bit of research, we know CKD5 is one of the main proteins that dictates this function. Here you can see a neuron and its axon trying to find its target. It's pretty amazing to watch. This was recorded in 1989. You can see as the axon strikes its target, it becomes excited and increases its uh, guidance towards that target. Looking through the AAIC 2022 genomic data, we see that the drug corrects function of the CDK5 gene. Beyond exonal guidance, CDK5 dysfunction also has implications in amyloid plaque creation, as well as tau and NFTs, or neurofibrillar tangles. We believe CDK5 is probably a key restorative gene post neuroinflammation dampening. An article from November 2021 titled, Targeting CDK5 in astrocytes promotes calcium homeostasis under excitotoxic conditions explains more of CDK5's role. The abstract is as follows. Glutamate excitotoxicity triggers overreaction or overactivation of CDK5 and increases calcium influx in neural cells, which promotes dendritic retraction, spine loss, increased mitochondrial calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum, and neuronal death. Our previous studies showed that CDK5 knockdown in astrocytes improved neurovascular integrity and cognitive functions and exerts neuroprotective effects. However, how CDK5 targeted astrocytes affects calcium regulation and whether this phenomenon is associated with changes in neural plasticity have not yet been analyzed. In this study, CDK5 knockdown astrocytes transplanted in CA3 remained at the injection site without proliferation, regulated calcium in the CA1 hippocampal region after excitotoxicity by glutamate in ex vivo hippocampal slices, improving synapsin and PSD95 clustering. These CDK5 knockdown astrocytes induced astrocyte stellation and neuroprotection after excitotoxicity induced by glutamate in vitro. Also, these effects were supported by CDK5 inhibition in vitro through intracellular stabilization of calcium levels in astrocytes. Additionally, these cells in co-cultures restored calcium homeostasis in neurons, redistributing calcium from somas to dendrites. Accompanied by dendrite branching, higher dendritic spines and synapsin PSD95 clustering. In summary, Induction of calcium homeostasis at the CA1 hippocampal area by CDK5 knockdown astrocytes transplanted in the CA3 area highlights the role of astrocytes as a cell therapy target due to CDK5 knockdown astrocyte mediated synaptic clustering, calcium spreading regulation between both areas, and recovery of the intracellular astrocyte neuron calcium imbalance and plasticity impairment generated by glutamate excitotoxicity. The key takeaway here is showcasing glutamate's role in CDK5 dysfunction, glutamate having been regulated in Anavex's previous Rett syndrome patients, and calcium disruption, something that we here at Satsi Analytics have hit on a number of times, possibly being the lichpin to all CNS disorders. Fixing CDK5 returns plasticity for axons and synapses for local and global neuronal connections. For our next topic, we want to read this new abstract from this month regarding serotonin degradation and amyloid deposition in mild cognitive impairment. Degeneration of the serotonin system has been observed in Alzheimer's disease and in mild cognitive impairment. In transgenic amyloid mouse models, serotonin degeneration is detected prior to widespread cortical beta amyloid deposition, also suggesting that serotonin 
uh, degeneration may be observed in preclinical Alzheimer's disease. The differences in the distribution of serotonin degeneration reflected by the loss of serotonin transporter 5-HTT relative to amyloid beta deposition was measured with PET in a group of individuals with MCI and a group of healthy older adults. A multimodal partial least squares algorithm was applied to identify the spatial co covariance pattern between 5-HTT availability and amyloid beta deposition. 45 individuals with MCI and 35 healthy older adults were studied, 22 and 27 of whom were included in the analysis. Uh, they were amyloid positive and amyloid negative, respectively. A pattern of lower cortical, subcortical, and limbic 5-HTT availability and higher cortical amyloid beta deposition distinguished the MCI from the healthy older control patients. Greater expression of this pattern was correlated with greater deficits in memory and executive function in the MCI group, not in the control group. The conclusion is that a spatial covariance pattern of lower 5-HTT availability and amyloid beta deposition was observed to a greater extent in an MCI group relative to a control group and was associated with cognitive impairment in the MCI group. The results support the application of MMPLS to understand the neurochemical changes associated with amyloid beta deposition in the course of preclinical Alzheimer's disease. The takeaway here is that MCI patients were more likely to have serotonin dysfunction and those with greater dysfunction had greater cognitive decline in the MCI group. Now my 2022 uh, MOA meta-analysis, I had previously assessed that serotonin over all other neurotransmitters was tied to CNS disorders. And also the most relevant neurotransmitter to Blarcamazine's MOA. As you can see here, we assessed previously that the indications such as Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, dementia, Parkinson's disease, Rett syndrome, infantile sp spasms, Fragile X, Autism Spectrum, Frontotemporal Dementia, Depression, Cancer, Cerebral Palsy, Sexual Dysfunction, General Aging, ALS, Multiple Sclerosis, Heart Disease, and Insomnia and Sleep all had significant correlation to 5-HT expression, also known as serotonin. Finally, to finish today's video, we'll go over a January 2023 publication on Sigma-1 receptor agonists and diabetes which I did forward off to Anavex for their analysis. I'm just going to read a few portions of this article as it's really quite lengthy. Uh, so again, this is Sigma-1 receptor as a protective factor for diabetes-associated cognitive dysfunction via regulating astrocytic endoplasmic reticulum mitochondrion contact and endoplasmic reticulum stress. So the prevalence of diabetes-associated cognitive dysfunction, also known as DACD, has increased to 13.5%. Dementia, as the most severe DACD, is the second leading cause of death in patients with diabetes. Hence, the potential mechanisms of DACD for slowing or halting its progression need to be urgently explored. Given that the sigma-1 receptor, a chaperone protein located in the endoplasmic reticulum mitochondrion contact membranes, to regulate ER stress, also known as ERS, is associated with cognitive outcomes in neurodegenerative diseases. This study aims to investigate the role of astrocytic sigma-1 receptor in DACD and its underlying mechanisms. We constructed a type 1 diabetes model known as T1DM to evaluate the astrocytic sigma-1 receptor mechanism on synapse and cognitive function changes. In vitro, high glucose concentration downregulated sigma-1 receptor and aggravated ER stress in astrocytes, resulting in synapse deficits. Again, CDK5, the protein that we were talking about earlier today, assists both synapses and axons. So just keep that in mind as we go throughout this article. Pre-084, a high affinity and selective sigma-1 receptor agonist inhibited astrocytic ERS and complement cascades and restored synaptic damage while the sigma-1 receptor antagonist displayed the opposite result. Additionally, the synaptic loss and neurobehavioral dysfunction of mice with T1DM were less pronounced in pre-084. 
Although type 1 diabetes, or T1DM, is less common than T2DM, or type 2 diabetes, its incidence has increased worldwide. The new cases of T1DM in China are predicted to increase by 1.57 times over the next decade. Patients with T1DM, especially the young ones, confer a higher risk of subsequent dementia than those with T2DM. Therefore, the underlying mechanisms of DACD, particularly T1DM-related cognitive decline, need to be explored in further studies. Endoplasmic reticulum stress as a universal mechanism that participates in many neurodegenerative diseases and chronic metabolic diseases such as diabetes result in misfolded and unfolded protein accumulation and disruption of regular endoplasmic reticulum functions. The sigma-1 receptor located in the mitochondria-associated endoplasmic reticulum membrane, also known as MAM, which we discussed in our last video, usually binds to BIP as an ER chaperone to ensure the function and stability of certain signaling molecules, regulating calcium homeostasis, improving MAM function, and preventing the occurrence of endoplasmic reticulum stress. It is broadly spread throughout the brain, including the hippocampus, and is implicated in cytodifferentiation, neuroprotection, neuroplasticity, and cognitive function. Sigma-1 receptors are enriched in neurons, astrocytes, and microglia. Although neuronal sigma-1 receptor has become a breakthrough target for alleviating neurodegenerative disorders, the effect of astrocytic sigma-1 receptor is also significant since astrocytes also express it abundantly. Sigma-1 receptors and its ligands may block the inflammatory response by decreasing the number of reactive astrocytes in rodent models of stroke and ALS. However, evidence confirming the sigma-1 receptor changes in astrocytes in the brain of patients with diabetes is lacking, hence further studies are needed to elucidate the cellular mechanisms of astrocytic sigma-1 receptor during DACD. In this study, we demonstrated that activating astrocytic sigma-1 receptor improves synaptic, def uh, synaptic deficits and cognitive dysfunction in DACD, which involved reducing ER mitochondrion contact, alleviating endoplasmic reticulum stress, and decreasing C3C3A production. These findings revealed the potential mechanism of sigma-1 receptor in treating neurodegenerative diseases, which might be a potential therapeutic target for preventing DACD. So they go over... Uh, how they came to their conclusions, and I'm just going to skip through to the results. So the results is that a decrease in sigma-1 receptor expression was associated with endoplasmic reticulum stress of astrocytes exposed to a high glucose concentration. The results revealed that the expression of BIP protein significantly increased in the high glucose group and the disassociation of BIP from protein Kinase RNA-like ER kinase, also known as PERC, we've discussed this in uh, previous articles, uh, induced ERS. In the high glucose group, the expression of other ERS-related proteins, uh, including the translation initiation factor 2 alpha, activating transcription factor ATF4, and CHOP, increased. So sigma-1 receptor in ERS of high-glucose-induced astrocytes observed that BIP, ATF4, and CHOP protein levels were decreased in the, astrocyte, in the astrocytes in the high-glucose and pre-084 group compared with the high-glucose-induced astrocytes. These data verified that sigma-1 receptor participated in high-glucose-induced endoplasmic reticulum stress in astrocytes. Activation of sigma-1 receptor reduced endoplasmic reticulum stress and astrocytic ER mitochondrion contact in the hippocampus of mice with type 1 diabetes. Sigma-1 receptor agonists alleviated the activation of endoplasmic reticulum stress and the enhancement of the endoplasmic reticulum mitochondrion contact in astrocytes. Activation of sigma-1 receptor save synaptic loss and cognitive dysfunction in mice with type 1 diabetes. Based on Golgi staining, dendritic protrusions are typically divided into four categories, philopodia, fin, mushroom, and stubby spines. We found a varying reduction in different type of spines and a significant decrease in total dendritic spine density in the hippocampal CA1 region of mice with 
type 1 diabetes. The hippocampal CA1 region, neurons of mice with T1DM or type 1 diabetes exhibited decreased neuronal complexity corresponding to a shortened dendritic length. The neuronal complexity was elevated to a normal level after pre-084 treatment and the destructive dendritic length was repaired. Based on the aforementioned findings, we concluded that the sigma-1 receptor agonist could recover synaptic degradation and cognitive disorder in mice with type 1 diabetes. So DACD has evolved as a second leading contributor to diabetes-caused deaths. As no established treatment exists that can halt or delay DACD progression, except for adequate uh, symptomatic treatments, the underlying mechanism of DACD needs to be elucidated to provide a theoretical framework for its therapy. Sigma-1 receptor and C3 are key molecules in regulating neurodegenerative diseases. However, their functional relationship with DACD remains unclear. This study demonstrated that high glucose concentration increases endoplasmic reticulum stress and the complement cascade reaction might at least partially uh, or at least partly be regulated by astrocytic sigma-1 receptor. The sigma-1 receptor agonist, in this case pre-084, reduced astrocytic ER mitochondrion contact, ERS-related protein expression, and C3C3A secretion in mice with type 1 diabetes. Moreover, the activation of sigma-1 receptor and the inhibition of C3C3A improved the synaptic and cognitive dysfunctions providing prospective therapeutic targets for treating DACD. Sigma-1 receptor as an ER chaperone to bind BIP residing specifically at the lipid raft of MAM plays a pivotal role in the physiopathology and neuroprotective effects in several neurodegenerative diseases which deserves translation in preclinical or clinical trials. However, diseases such as obesity or diabetes drove the enrichment of MAM in various cells, resulting in mitochondrial dysfunction, calcium over overload, and insulin resistance. In addition to excessive formation, structural destruction of MAMs will also disturb cellular function. Consistent with the evidence that MAM alterations and ERS are common features among various neurodegenerative disorders, studies have observed that sigma-1 receptors appear to induce overt cell homeostasis primarily by directly preventing the occurrence of ERS as well as inflammation. In respect of the central nervous system, the sigma-1 receptor or sigma-1 receptors were widely expressed and were detected. Uh, detected in neurons, interneurons, and all glial cell types, including astrocytes and microglia. Activation of sigma-1 may block the inflammatory response in rodent models of stroke and ALS via decreasing the number of reactive astrocytes and suppress amyloid beta-mediated hippocampal astrocyte and microglial uh, proliferation. Studies show that the sigma-1 receptor ablation mice that exhibited a decrease in motor coordination upregulated uh, PEIF2 alpha and CHOP expression. Sigma 1 receptor knockout or sigma 1 receptor blockade treatment worsened neurotox neurotoxicity and behavioral deficits, while several agonists, including pre 084, exhibited neuroprotection to animal models of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. Sigma 1 receptor stimulation could reduce neuronal amyloid beta deposition and improve the stability of mushroom spines. Consistent with the findings of previous studies, the spatial learning and memory functions were recovered in the mice with type 1 diabetes treated with pre-084, then in the mice with type 1 diabetes in the study, indicating that activating sigma-1 receptors had beneficial effects in DACD. A previous study showed that among the 233 specific proteins interacting with sigma-1 receptors, BIP was specifically enriched. Under pathological conditions, BIP disassociates uh, from the three ERS sensors and activates to induce unfolded protein reaction uh, and ERS, which is something we've talked about many times before, uh, uh, unfolded protein response on, on the SOTCanalytics.com website. So in conclusion, we revealed that the activation of sigma-1 receptor alleviated the enhancement of ER mitochondrion contact, ERS activation, and complement cascade reaction in astrocytes, which was advantageous to synaptic and cognitive function uh, recovery. 
The results of the study not only confirmed the cellular mechanisms of astrocytic sigma-1 receptor activation, saving complement-mediated synapse de deficits and cognitive disorder in the pathogenesis of DACD, but also provided evidence for ideal clinical translation treatment using sigma-1 receptor agonists. In conclusion, it's amazing the research that is still being published even in January of this year, backing up wide-reaching therapeutic value of sigma-1 agonists. Being that black populations have higher incidence of diabetes and are underrepresented in clinical trials, this could be an exciting future approach for Anavex, which is why I shared the article with them. There's also quite a bit of interest at CTAD 2022 regarding insulin and CNS dysfunction. Again, going back to the 2022 AAIC genomic analysis, larkamazine has already proven to affect patients in the age-rage signaling pathway, which has major ties to diabetic complication, so there is a lot of fuel towards larkamazine treating cognitive impairment caused by diabetes. Thank you everyone so much for watching. My next video upload will probably be an in-person interview I'll be conducting soon with Dr. Grimmer in Munich. Until then, please feel free to like and subscribe, comment any questions or thoughts below, and visit sotsianalytics.com, which will be updated in the next few days with auxiliary information with what was covered today. Until next time.